Is it worth talking about the pivot or do you want to laugh that off? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the pivot. I All right, so what do you think? <laughs> then do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, pivot means different things to different people. Is it, is it when they dial down the, the rate cuts? Is it when they actually pause? Is it when they cut? And, uh, you know, I think uh, specifically for the Fed, uh, we're in the camp at Nomura that it's still a long, long way away in terms of when we're going to see them pause. Uh, we don't think it's until uh, after the March meeting. So we have the Fed funds rate going all the way to 5.5% uh, by March. And I think the Fed, uh, you know, the, the risk with the Fed kind of giving hints of a pivot, and we saw this a little bit with the RBA yesterday, is the markets are itching for that pivot. And it, it can ease financial conditions so much, particularly if the Fed does it, that it unwinds a lot of the tightening that they've been doing. And then they've got to kind of make up for that more. So I think they're going to be talking tough for quite some time yet. And you've been coming up with kind of crunching the numbers about, you know, where are we, are we likely to see that hard landing scenario? Where are we going to see maybe less vulnerable and a soft landing? What differentiates that, that classification and who is most at risk? Yeah, we thought we'd, we'd look at past tightening cycles, uh, and we looked at um, lots of them, 110, in fact, across 30 countries. And, and we found some interesting things when we broke down after tightening cycles. We looked at, we broke down the, the, the episodes which are hard landings versus soft landings. I think there was about 40 hard landings and about 60, 60 or so soft landings. And what we found for hard landings was if you had, before the tightening cycle started, high inflation, or if you had uh, excessive house price growth or high household or corporate debt, there was a bigger risk of a hard landing after the tightening cycle. And we also found during the tightening cycle, if, um, I guess this is, it makes a lot of intuitive sense, but if rates went up a, a whole a substantial amount, there was a bigger risk of a hard landing. But also if the rate hiking cycle lasted for a long time, uh, longer than average, mm. there was a bigger risk of a, hard, uh, of a hard landing. And by contrast, if the rate hikes were front loaded, like happening early on in the in the in the tightening cycle, most of the hikes, there was a lower risk of a hard landing. So th there was interesting differences, and we looked at all those. And then I guess what we thought was, hey, what about if we look at those features and apply them to what's happening in this current tightening cycle to see what's happening? Hmm. Rob, there's a real crisis out there, really, with uh, energy prices. If you look in local currency terms, they're hugely higher than they would be in the U.S. Percentage, as a percentage anyway. This is going to take its toll. Uh, coming against a backdrop, of course, of uh, tightening monetary policy, it's creating a perfect storm, is it not? Yeah, I mean, I, in our view, uh, it is going to have a um, significant effect on e economies, uh, more so than we think central banks are letting on. Uh, so we are forecasting uh, recessions. So it, to give you some numbers, for next year, we have GDP growth in the U.S. at minus 1.1%. For Europe, it's even worse. For the Eurozone, we have minus 1.6 and UK minus 1.4. And negative growth in some of the other economies which have had big housing booms and large debt build-up, such as Australia and Canada and South Korea. So, yeah, Rich, we think, um, <clears throat> you know, and it's not just monetary tightening. It's also fiscal policy is not being as supportive. There is a severe cost of living crisis. And there's a lot of uh, what we're seeing in Asia, and I think it's going to show up more in the West. Asia is the big manufacturing hub. There's a growing unintended inventory build happening right now. And that means you need less production going forward. So it's all these factors. Mm. It, what if China recovers next year? To what extent can that help? If that's a big if, of course. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a it's a good question, David. Uh, we think you know China's economy, so it's extremely weak now, and we think it's 
it's probably going to stay weak for a, a few more quarters. Uh, but, you know, come around uh, second quarter next year, we do think, uh, uh, hope, hoping that um, zero COVID strategy ends and we get more stimulus, China's economy will start to uh, rebound. And there could be quite a bit of pent up demand, as we've seen in other countries that have relaxed their, um, their restrictions. So China's very interesting. It's uh, very counter cyclical. It's interesting that most economies nearly everywhere are slowing down and nearly all central banks are raising rates. The one exception where, um, you know, the economy is already slowed and rates are being cut and fiscal policy is being eased is China. So China could be the one that kind of bounces back before other ones uh, in the world. Mm. And Rob, you know, I think we've talked a lot of uh, some of your peers that have basically said, look, things are looking bad, but it's not as bad as what we saw in 97. Uh, we're not close to that. But h how do you look at the whole, how this whole is going to play out, the, this whole kind of weakening of, of currencies on import prices? Does it be somewhat offset by the slide in energy prices? How much does that actually help? Yeah, so we're getting questions like for, like that from the investors now with Asian currencies weakening, so just hinting, you know, is this the start of another Asian crisis? Our emphatic answer is is no. Um, I think Asian economies are in much better shape than they were back in 96, whether you look at uh, foreign currency external debt, whether you look at uh, FX reserves, current account positions, and just letting currencies be more flexible. So very different. That said... You know, we are seeing um, uh, aggressive Fed uh, and we are seeing currencies weaken. I think what Asian uh, policymakers are starting to do, I call it an eclectic approach. They've learnt lessons from the Asian crisis. They're not just going to be uh, dogmatic and just focus on defending currencies or, or doing, you know, one, one policy in extreme. I think they're doing multiple, using multiple instruments. So they will let currencies weaken to an extent, but opportunistically they will intervene to smooth the currency depreciation. They'll also raise rates, and I think they'll use a whole bunch of um, kind of capital control instruments as well, whether it's um, new regulations on state-owned companies or, or taxes or macroprudential measures, things to throw sand in the wheel on capital outflows. So I think it's a combination of factors, and I think it's a much cleverer strategy that Asian policymakers have, and I think if they stick to it and prudent with it, Asia is going to be in a very strong position to be one of the first regions to Rob, rebound uh, from this mess Rob, we're in. 